This sermon was preached at Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. It's part of our series, 1 Corinthians, Viewing Life Through the Gospel Lens. We hope that you're challenged and encouraged by it. When have you experienced <coughs> experience something and not really fully appreciated it? Maybe you ate at a fancy restaurant and you didn't really understand how much of a meal it was. I remember one time when uh, we took our little kids when they were like one and three and they had this awesome meal in front of them and they didn't know how good of a meal they had. Don't really expect much when they're one and three, but you, you know what I mean. Maybe somebody gave you an expensive drink, a, a fancy shake with all kinds of fresh fruit and you had no idea how good it really was. Or maybe you went to a play and saw an actor or an actress and didn't realize that you were seeing somebody so famous. Or maybe you're a, a, a sports fan. My family and I, I've been an Iowa Hawkeye fans for a long time, and we've been getting into Iowa basketball. We have Caitlin Clark, and she just broke a record this week. And it's so fun to watch. It's, gonna, it's hard to even think what life will be like next season if she's not back. We take those things for granted. Well, today I ask you that question because oftentimes in our own faith, there's things that we take for granted. There's things that happen behind the scenes that we don't always give credit to. And so today, what we're going to see as we continue our sermon series here uh, through 1 Corinthians at at Crossway, that's what we do. We just open up a book and we, we preach through it. And so we're going through the letter, the epistle of 1 Corinthians that Paul wrote to a church in Corinth. We're going to see that Paul's going to remind us of the source of godly wisdom and the, uh, remind us of who and what is working behind the scenes in our lives. And hopefully, through Paul's kind of illuminating it and bringing it to our own kind of mindset and, and, and thought of mind, it will give us hope as we go through the future and also remind us that God is at work in our lives even more than we may comprehend at times. And so today, we will look at 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 through 16. Uh, here at the Crossway, we just read the NIV, but obviously everybody here has different translations sometimes, but this is the word of the Lord. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, not wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen and what no ear has heard and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And what we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining the spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. And the person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord as to to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, I understand that this this text is a little dense, let's be honest. Um, There's a lot of things going in there, and there's a lot of different conversations there, and a lot of things that we can unpack. But hopefully, as we do, we'll make it more clear, and it will help us understand what's going on. One of the downsides, I think, of what we do, I love what we do at Crossway, don't get me wrong, just preach through a book chunk by chunk. But one of the things that kind of is missing sometimes is it's easy for us to get caught up in the text that we kind of forget the big picture. You know, we forget that the letters, like this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, would have been written in its entirety, or or read in its entirety, and looked at in its entirety in one setting. And so when we look at chunks by chunks, it's easy for us to kind of forget what Paul has been talking about before, and just focus on that little bit. If you remember, for the past couple weeks, the Apostle Paul, who planted the church in Corinth and then left, has been writing to the people who he cares deeply about, people that he knew. He spent a year and a half there, which is one of some of the longest he ever spent planting a church. 
telling them that they have to be careful because they've been allowing their culture to dictate and to influence their lives more than they realize. They had rather, they had let the gospel and it's, it, their, their culture and its infatuation with the individual teachers is create divisions in the church. And also it had created in them this desire to go for the new and the hip wisdom of the day rather than trusting the truth that he had been talking about. And so throughout this thing, he's been talking about wisdom and how we need to put our hope and trust in the true source of wisdom and let the gospel shape our vantage point and our viewpoint. That's why we have this image that we did where you see the glasses and you see clarity. I'm getting to the age now where I have to have those glasses. Uh, Steph asked me to read something. I'm like, I can't read that unless you give me my reading glasses because it was blurry. And then all of a sudden, when I put on my reading glasses, I can see it and it's clear. And what he's encouraging is that the, the first Corinthians, the Corinthians do that in this letter of first Corinthians, that they put on the gospel lens and they allow it to see clearly what's going on around them. And this is exactly what he's trying to do. Sometimes there are things working in our lives that we don't give the proper credit to. And in this case, he wants to give the spirit of God proper credit in our life for they are the source of godly wisdom. But what he starts off is he starts by wanting the the Corinthians to know, don't go after these new fads and these things that they consider new kinds of wisdom. He says, no, if you want to be mature, if you want to know the best wisdom that you can have, what you need to do is understand God's gospel is it. It is the best wisdom that you can pursue. He uses language of maturity. Now, we will see at later points in his, in his letter, he will talk about how Christians can be mature, which means they allow more of their life to be centered on the gospel and they allow it to impact more of their vision for, for their lives. And there's immature Christians who are learning to do that. But in this text, the maturity that he talks about isn't within Christians who are mature and immature, but rather what he's saying is all the wisdom around you that people are proclaiming as this new thing and it's the thing that you need to know and put your hope and trust in as mature, that's not really mature. The mature wisdom, the true wisdom is the gospel. And if you want to understand life and if you want to, to do that, then you have to become wise in the gospel. And that's what he's encouraging them to do. He makes it absolutely clear that God crafted his plan of redemption in the very beginning. He says, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden, that God destined for your glory before time began. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a little mind boggling to me. I'm pretty much stuck in my time continuum. I don't know anything outside of time. And so to think that God could literally know what's going to happen before it happens and that he knows that we would sin and create this plan of redemption outside of time is a little bit mind boggling. But what Paul says is that's exactly what it is, that God had a plan of redemption for you and I and for the entire world. And his plan of redemption was centered on Jesus. And it began in the very, very beginning. It's very beginning. It wasn't plan B. This is what he had. He knew how he was going to act in your life and in my life. And he was going to act in Jesus. Now he admits that the fullness of God's plan was hidden for years under Christ's crucifixion until Christ's crucifixion revealed it. The image that I have here is that of an artist who is ready to put on this display, but he has a cloth over it. I remember when I was in college, my neighbor who actually bought my folks' house, the house that I grew up in until junior high, was the art teacher at the college that my dad taught. And it was this big deal because he created this statue that was going to go in front of our education building at the college I went to. And so we see that he's putting this thing together, and then they put a cloth over top of it. And we kept on wondering what was going to happen. Now, it was called the gift, and we didn't think it was that great of a gift. But what we were waiting for was, how was this thing going to be revealed? We could see the shape of it, but we didn't quite understand what it was. Now, I do not appreciate art, so let's just put that on the table, okay? It was probably a beautiful piece of art, but... until that cloth was removed, we couldn't see it in its fullness. We could tell that it was going to be a person. We could tell it kind of had its hands out, all these things. But until that cloth was removed and it was completely revealed. And what Paul says is that for years, until Christ came, there was these foreshadows and there were the prophets who were talking 
and telling us how God was going to act. If you were here with us in November, in Advent, we looked at how in the very beginning, after Adam and Eve sinned, in Genesis 3, right away, God said he was going to send a redeemer. And we looked at all different things in the Psalms and the prophets, how they all pointed to how Jesus was going to come, but they were kind of the outline. And But then what Paul says is, when Jesus Christ was revealed, when he went through his crucifixion, God's plan was completely revealed, and you could see the statue underneath it. He says it was hidden, but now it's been completely revealed. And so what he's saying here is that the truth of God's plan, the fullness of it, at least the part of redemption, we'll see it in its full completion when Christ comes again, has now been revealed. And if we want to know what true wisdom is, we have to come to grips with what that is. And so that's where he starts off. He says, look, the most mature wisdom, the the wisdom that you can have isn't some newfangled thing, but rather the story of God's redemption and allowing it to shape your life. But he admits that, listen, not everybody is going to understand the wisdom that's contained in the gospel. He says it right there. We, however, speak among the mature, not the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, which reminds us that we all are going to face our death. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that's been hidden and destined for glory before time again. And what he highlights there is that some will understand it and some will not. And what he does is he highlights and he he quotes, he cites Isaiah 63 verse 4 to illustrate historical misunderstandings of God's redemptive plan. He says it here, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things of God has prepared for those. And so he says, from the very beginning, even though he's tried to make it as clear as he can that Jesus is coming, some people haven't grasped it. And he says, it's obvious that the religious leaders didn't get it because if they got who Jesus was, They wouldn't have been upset by him. They wouldn't feel threatened by him and put him through a tragedy of a trial. They would have put their hope and trust in him. They would not have crucified him. Now, that's all part of God's plan, but they would have not been privy to that or part of it if they had understood the wisdom that was in front of them, God's wisdom there. But he says there's another group that that will understand this wisdom and how they will understand it. And the way that they understand it is not in their own might or their own power, but rather he makes it absolutely clear in all this language of the Spirit that it is God's Spirit that revealed the gospel to believers. Again, I think images are helpful. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 15, Paul, in a letter, second letter to the Corinthians, will talk about how there's a veil covering the hearts of non-believers. And in some senses, What's happened is even if you're wrestling through faith right now as you're trying to figure out like, hey, I don't know if this really makes sense, it's not becoming clear. And maybe you're starting to see that that maybe this could make sense and you're opening your heart to it, but, but it's still not quite clear. Well, that's this veil that he talks about. And what Paul says is that the way that we have our eyes open to the truth of the gospel is that the Spirit removes these blinders. It's like a horse who wears these blinders and they can see and and they see narrowly, but all of a sudden the Spirit opens it up and and all of a sudden it clicks and it makes sense. Now how it makes sense to us and the journey of how we get to that spot is completely different. But the Spirit works in the lives of those who put their hope and trust in Jesus. Now he says it, if you don't have the Spirit, you'll consider the gospel foolishness. That's what he says. He says, the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come and considers them foolishness. And Paul can tell you all kinds of situations where literally he was called the fool. We'll see one later with Festus, who was so excited to listen to Paul's message because he heard he was this new guy who burst onto the scene. And the minute that Paul speaks, he says, you're a fool. And so we shouldn't be shocked when people look at our faith and think, man, it just doesn't make sense. Like, We shouldn't be caught off guard by that. But what Paul says is that those who do have the Spirit, they will be able to discern the gospel's truth. And as I said before, every single one of us in this room who put our hope and trust in Jesus, God has used a different path to bring us to faith. For some, you grew up in the church like me, and it's like it doesn't even seem like there's ever a time where I didn't know the gospel. Now, I wrestled with it. I revolted against it. There are certain things I thought were ridiculous, and narrow-minded, 
And the judgmentalness and the hypocrisy in the church felt like it almost drove me away. But yet at the same time, there was this time in my life where, where it started to make sense. And it's, even the hypocrisy in the church reminded me, man, we're still sinners in need of God's grace. But there is a path. For some of you, you had nothing to do with the church. Like, you thought the church was ridiculous. Your, your parents told you it is a bunch of rubbish. And slowly but surely, maybe it was a neighbor that you talked to, or a friend, or a coworker, or maybe it's people that you listen to on YouTube, or, or uh, whatever it is that God slowly but surely said, man, maybe this makes sense. And it wasn't an emotional thing. It was like, oh yeah, the historical record or the, the way that it talks about good and bad in the world and the intricacy of the design, like it, it all kind of makes sense that maybe there was this grand designer and, and, and the story of scripture fills in all these logical things and what once didn't make sense all of a sudden does. And what Paul wants us to see is that that whole process was not just us. It was Literally the Spirit of God opening our hearts to it, empowering us, revealing the truth to us more than we want or than we ever recognize. In the process, it may often feel like it's us and our self-discovery. But what Paul is saying is that the Spirit of God is at work empowering us and helping us to understand it. But he says this: that ultimately what the Spirit does is the Spirit connects the believers to the heart of God. And this is important for us, especially in this day and age, because sometimes when we think about spirituality, at least in my contacts and, and people that I run into, you know, as long as you believe in anything spiritual, it's good. Scripture is absolutely clear that the true spirit will connect us to the heart of God and the heart of God is the crucifixion. Because in the crucifixion of Jesus, it shows that yes, we are broken and yes, we are sinners, but God's love for us is greater than our sin. And he sent his son to die on the cross so that it can be given to us as a free gift. That's what the power of the spirit connects us to. But he says, the spirit searches all those things, even the deep things of God, for who knows a person's thoughts except for their own spirit within them. In the same one, Wait, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we've received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. What it means is that you and I have at some point in our lives, that truth has come alive. And, and it may not be this emotional thing. It may be an intellectual thing. For some of us, it's emotional. For me, I kind of always intellectually believed it, but I wrestled with my own sin and really thinking that God could love somebody who had sin in their lives. And it was literally God using people who were made kind of like, uh, just spoke truth to me and said, God's grace is greater. That, that made it kind of come alive. And so there's an emotional side of things too. For some of us, it's, it's not emotional at all. It was like a worldview thing. Like, yes, it all makes sense. But no matter what it is, all of us who have put our hope and trust in Jesus, the Spirit is the one who connects us to the heart of God. Now, I also want you to see this because the heart of God shows love to us and grace to us. It also communicates a way of living for us that pleases God. You may know a little bit about me that you see on, on stage or hopefully you get to know me outside uh, of uh, this setting when I'm just speaking up here, and you know my heart, and you get to know what makes me tick. But even the knowledge that you have is just a glimpse of the of knowledge that I have of what's going on. I mean, I think of my own kids. They, they know some of my goals for them, but they don't know really the heart that I have for them, the desires I have for them, how my heart hurts when they go through difficult things, even though they like to kid me that I don't show emotions. But you get what I'm saying? Like, but what this says is that the Spirit knows the deepest thoughts and desires of God. And that He tries to, He communicates. He doesn't try. He, he communicates those things to us. 
that's an important truth for us to know because I think that's something that we need to remember as we move forward, and we'll look at that in a second. But the last thing that we see about the Spirit is that the Spirit empowered Paul's teaching. Now, it empowered his teaching as he preached in Corinth and went to all these different towns and he spoke there. It also empowered the Word of God. We think there's something different about the Bible. It speaks what God wants us to know, and it communicates His truth in a powerful way. And Paul highlights this, that it's the Spirit who empowered Paul's teaching. But what Paul wants us to understand is that even though we may not have recognized it or we may not always see how the Spirit is working in our lives, that the Spirit is always, always at work. The Spirit was the one who shaped us into who we are, who put the people in our past, who opened us up to this truth, and he wants to give him the proper perspective and credit. That's what he hopes to do in this passage. And he wants to encourage the Corinthians to to put their trust in him, to trust that wisdom, and to trust their connection to God, to allow it to, to dominate more of their lives. This is the maturity that they've longed for. Well, how does this impact me? I mean, how does this idea of the Spirit impact me? There's a couple things I think as I was thinking about it this week. The first is it keeps us humble. Why does it keep us humble? Well, our faith is a complete gift from God. He says it this, what you've received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of the one who is God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. If you look at Ephesians 2, it says that it's by the grace of God that we are saved so that no one can boast. And Christians, sometimes, the longer that we're Christians and the less in touch we are with our sins, sometimes this kind of superiority and self-righteousness can creep into our own hearts. But if we truly understand that everything, including our spiritual growth and our faith in God, is all the work of the Spirit of God in us, now we do put effort in, it's not to say that we don't, then it keeps us humble because we realize that like, yes, we do our part, but let's be honest, our part, God's part. And it helps us frame that. And that humility is important. The second thing is I think it should help us to be patient with those who have not responded to the gospel. You know, sometimes we can have this adversarial relationship with those who are outside the gospel. We can be frustrated with that they don't think what we think, and and it can kind of create this kind of tension. But Paul says we shouldn't be surprised that some people don't understand what we understand, that they think what we think is foolish. It's always been that way, and it always will be that way. And, And sometimes even having that mindset can help us be patient with those when quite frankly, they may come at us and scoff at us or make fun of us or that. And we can be patient and gracious because we understand that they're still trying to figure things out. And and now we pray that the Spirit will give them that truth eventually, but it gives us a patience with them. As I said earlier, the best example I have is in Acts 26, where Festus, he's a Roman governor, wants to talk to Paul. Like he hear Paul. He, he hears that he's going to go in front of, I think it's Agrippa. And, and so he says, hey, can I come and spend time with him? Because I've been hearing about this great orator and what he's been messing and what, what's happening and this following that's created. And Paul lays out his testimony of how Jesus revealed himself to him and how God had worked in his life. And literally Paul, Festus interrupts him. And he says, you're out of your mind, Paul. Your great learning is driving you insane. Uh, my first reaction would not be what Paul's was. There's a graciousness to him, though. There's a patience. He says, what I'm saying is true and reasonable. There's a calmness in him because he realizes that there's bigger factors at work. And so the more that we understand how the Spirit of God is at work in our own lives, it creates humility in us, but it also creates patience. We don't have to be a reactionary to people if they disagree with us, but rather we can see that this is the way that the world will be. And when we engage with people, we can be kind and gracious and give them the space that they need for the Spirit to open their own eyes. Sometimes it may be speaking truth and 
a, a direct way, but not a mean way. But there's a patience up there. But the last thing I think it should do is it should give us hope. It should give us hope. And I think there's two reasons. I mean, there's always more, but there's two that I think it should. That is this, that the Spirit has the power to break through our loved one's cold hearts. And maybe I should even put not just our loved ones, but our own cold hearts. Because sometimes it's easy for us to go through life and for us to get hardened by things that have happened. And we can feel like, are we ever going to get overcome this? We can't. We can't. But the Spirit can. And so when we see loved ones who feel like they're going in the wrong direction and we wonder, like, (laughs) will they ever get it? We can have hope because they, in their own power, might not be able to get it, but the Spirit of God can put together whatever path needs to happen for them to come to faith in Christ and to, to come to understand the truth that's there. And so no matter how far away it may seem people are, we know that the Spirit is greater. The text that I'm going to look at here that was a little bit before the text that we had for our text says that the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you who raised Christ from the dead and will also give life to your mortal bodies because the Spirit, His Spirit is who lives in you. And what that means is that no matter how distant people may be, the Spirit of God is more powerful than their distance and their separation from God. But it also gives us hope because the Spirit will keep us connected to God and guide us through life's challenges. You know, I think most of what we struggle with as believers is really wondering, like, will God give me the strength I need to get through this? Will whatever is happening, can he, he use it? Will I have the strength? Will I have what I need to get through it? And and we can wonder and and worry. And what this text and what Romans reminds us of is that God's the one who's at work. He's the one guiding and directing us. And he will give us what I need. need. Now, it may not always feel like it. We, We want security. We want comfort. We want whatever. But even the text that we read for our uh, assurance of pardon says that if, we, that, that if we have the Spirit of Christ in us, we will know that we're children of God and we'll know that and, and that we're heirs of God. And heirs of God means that we will get to spend all of eternity with Him because of the work that Christ... And then it says, if indeed we share in His suffering in order that we may also share in His glory. Right there he says, look, Just because we are children of God doesn't mean that life isn't going to sometimes be hard and that we aren't going to suffer. But it doesn't mean that God's Spirit isn't at work in our lives and that He can't even, that He he can use those things to draw us to faith in Him and to help us put our trust in Him. And often I see it in my own life and in the lives of you all and people around me that it is in those moments that we feel like we are weakest and frailest, that we actually are connected to God in a way that doesn't necessarily make sense. That's why Paul, in the second letter to Corinthians, says that when I feel weak, I see the power of God. And so he's going to boast about his weakness because it makes him rely on God more. And so this text reminds us of that truth, that even in our weakest moments, we have the Spirit of God, and He will guide us and challenge, through life's challenges, and that gives us hope. So what is Paul trying to do here? Paul's trying to help us realize that we are in a world where not everybody will value the things that we value. They will not view our view of the gospel and the truth that it communicates in a positive direction, and that's okay. But for those of us who have put our hope and trust in Jesus, it means that God's been at work in our lives even when we didn't recognize it. And for some of us who maybe are wrestling with it, like we don't even know what we believe about this, 
It's not by chance that you're wrestling through that stuff, I would say. All that happened as God's just revealing himself to you. And you may not be at a spot where it makes sense yet, but hang in there. Continue down that path because God can work in your own life and he can give you the clarity through the power of the Holy Spirit. Continue that investigation. But for those of us who do have the Spirit, let's not take it for granted. It connects us to God. It connects us to God. It connects us to His heart. And that gives us hope. It keeps us humble and it keeps us patient. So let's stay in touch with that humility. Let's stay in touch with that patience. But most importantly, let the the fact that the Spirit of God is at work in our lives give us hope and strength and peace through life's challenges. Let's pray. You have just watched a sermon from Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope that you enjoyed it, and we'd love to have you come join us for a worship service on Sunday at 10 a.m. at 311 North Parkway Avenue in Battleground, Washington. If you'd like to find more information about us online, you can find it at crosswaychurchwa.com.